Uh, in addition, Welcome everyone. I'm happy to see that you're joining us. We're going to give a few more uh, minutes or seconds for some of the folks to join us. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, you might want to start thinking about uh, what's important to you in finding out from the female founders uh, perspective, and that'll help generate some questions for you. So we'll be starting momentarily. I feel like we need some Jeopardy music. The suspense. <laughs> um, if any of the panelists have a song they want to launch into, feel free. Otherwise, we'll just wait. Uh, Pam, right. I guess, I'm oh, sorry, I was going to say if, if we, you know, have a, a, an extra minute or whatever while we wait for people, if we wanted to talk about some of the upcoming events or FI or whatever, which, you know, we, we will repeat later on, uh, just something besides dead air. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I know the suspense is killing you, Don, so we're just going to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Knox. I'm a business mentor and pitch consultant as a member of the leadership team of Founder Institute Keystone. It's my pleasure to welcome our female founders, our aspiring female founders, and a great big welcome to the smart men who advocate and advise female founders who have also joined us tonight as well. So happy to be here and we've got a great program lined up. Tonight's program is just one of the numerous educational and transformational programs that Founder Institute Keystone puts forth on behalf of the startup community here in the Delaware Valley. Our signature program is our pre-seed accelerator program that is actually enrolling now. And we're gonna share some information about that in a little bit, but suffice it to know that stated the end of the program, where we're gonna give you more details on where, how we help folks that have startups are just at the early stages of their startups and don't wanna go it alone. So stay to the end and our, you'll hear about how to enroll in that program and also news about our online events that are coming up. In order to help our program run smoothly tonight, we encourage you to come with your curiosity, listen intently, to the founders as they're answering my questions and we're moving along this round table, but utilize the QA function on your dashboard to pose your questions so that you go away more enriched and more empowered uh, to begin your startup journey or to continue your startup journey towards success. So let's begin. With me tonight, I have Minky Blue founder and CEO, Cyril Mosey. I have CEO and bagelologist, it's the first one I've met and I love it, uh, at The Greater Need, Michelle Carfagno, Journal My Health founder, Tracy Wilson Rossman, World Upstart, Upstart founder, Karina Sutnik, and co-founder of Campus and Stibidio, Libby Bossinger. Oh, ladies, I couldn't do this program tonight without you. We're so honored to have you here tonight sharing your expert expertise. I'd like you to add to that short introduction that I gave by telling the audience a little bit about your product, your service, your startup, what it does, who it serves, and how long you've been in business. And that'll give us a sense of the experts that we have here. So I'd like to ask uh, Tracy to start us off. Making sure to take myself off mute so I don't be, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> um, well, Journal My Health is not my first startup, um, but it is 
the first for-profit startup that I'm running on my own. Uh, it is officially, according to the documents, I think we are uh, 13 months in, um, although I will add a year in planning to that. So Journal My Health is a health tech platform to help people who have chronic conditions better tell their health stories to their healthcare providers for better health outcomes. And I'm using my background as somebody who has a chronic condition um, and my understanding of the journey and marrying that with my background in uh, tech so that there's this understanding of the use of um, your data to be able to tell your story. So I'm hoping that marriage helps us make, you know, have some change in the healthcare space because it's a lot to disrupt. Um, just my other background, um, I'm one of the early founders um, of Chariot Solutions, which is a software consulting firm, and we just turned 20 in July. Um, I'm also the founder uh, of Tech Girls, which is a nonprofit to help middle school girls to um, empower to empower them to embrace technology for their future careers in tech. Um, I took that from ideation to acquisition, and it was acquired three years ago by a larger nonprofit. And I'm also one of the early founders of um, Philly Startup Leaders, which is now one of the largest um, entrepreneurial uh, organizations in the Philadelphia um, area. So I think that uh, my specialty is creating um, sustainable organizations. So that's a little bit about me. And hi, Mrs. Putterman, I see you. <laughs> it's my son's middle, uh, high school, actually middle school math teacher. So I love it. I love it. Thanks for calling out your fans. So that's great. Thank you uh, for leading us off, Tracy. Uh, uh, Libby, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Libby Baltiger. I'm currently the co-founder at Campus, spelled with a V, and Studio, also spelled with a V. Um, this is a digital platform that we're building for young artists to learn, earn, and showcase their talent, really seeking to transform arts and entertainment as we know it today. Um, so we just successfully closed our pre-seed angel round with advice from Dawn here at Founder Institute. So very happy about that and celebrating. Um, I've uh, been interested in startups since the day I started my career. Um, was lucky enough to be on the founding team of Chipotle Mexican Grill. And we grew uh, from 200 to 2,500 restaurants while I was there over 16 years. Um, after I left Chipotle, I started my own consulting firm for companies in the food and beverage industry, as well as technology industries. Um, really focusing on this college age demographic has been a passion of mine since uh, I started my career. So now landing here, um, looking to shape young artists' lives in this, this sort of collegiate demographic is really a passion of mine. And if I could give you know one bit of advice of being an entrepreneur, you have to follow your passions. Um, it will it will take you you know through the end through the hard times. So so that's that's where um, that's where I am today. All right, thank you so much, Libby, for this introduction. And and you'll see as we go through that you know not only do we have a broad base of expertise given the products and services and businesses that they're building, but also the audiences that they're targeting. So this is going to be a rich panel. Uh, Cheryl, how about you? Sure, thank you so much for having me. I'm really geeked out about being on this panel tonight. Uh, these are so wonderful uh, females uh, founders on tonight. So thank you so much. My name is Cheryl Mosey and I'm the founder of Minky Blue and I design organizational travel and work bags. And so I came about doing this because I was the bag lady. I was taking two or three bags and taking the train in the city. I had my shoes in a plastic grocery bag. I had my bag for my lunch. And I was like, this is just too much, too much, too many bags. 
and uh, looked around on the train and saw other women carrying two or three bags. So I decided that, hey, I, I think I can make this bag, this vision I had. And so I decided to uh, start Minky Blue. Uh, we launched in 2014. And I'm excited that I'm selling to women around the world. Thank you, Sherelle. Uh, so again, we're bringing in this global perspective and someone else that can share a global perspective, I suspect, is uh, Karina. So why don't you take it next? Thank you, Pam. And so glad to be here among this fabulous women. Um, so just like Libby, I follow my passion throughout my career. I started in Silicon Valley working for startups there um, that went IPO twice, lost everything in 2000, like so many of us, um, but followed my passion. So in Silicon Valley, I was taking US companies to international markets. Then when I came to East Coast, I um, uh, built Accelerator at the University of Pennsylvania and ran it for five years. And I've met Tracy there as she was one of the partners. Um, and then I've built Global Soft Landing uh, program for the Science Center. Now I'm running my own consulting company, helping international companies enter U.S. markets. Um, we're focused on healthcare, but we're also contemplating expanding to other areas. And i um, happy to be here and um, talk about what it takes to enter other markets or raise money or be a female entrepreneur. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, perspective uh, to give us a kind of an anchor of where you're coming from. And Michelle, bring it to a close on our introductions. Tell us about your business. Okay, so I'm Michelle Carfagno. Um, and as Pam said, I am a bagelologist, which I named myself. Um, because when you have a business, you can call yourself whatever you want. So that's my official degree and title. Um, but how I came to be a bagelologist. So 10 years ago, my sister and my grandfather were diagnosed with celiac disease. And I had loved baking for as long as I could remember. And um, I decided that I wanted to get into the food industry and came up with a formula for a gluten-free and what's considered the top nine allergens. So there's no dairy, egg, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, or sesame. Um, so a line of bagels. And then we recently launched a line of soft pretzels. Uh, we're based right outside of Philadelphia and Ben Salem. And we do all of our manufacturing there. And we, um, we are a consumer goods company. So we're not open to the public. Uh, we sell through retailers like Wegmans, Whole Foods, ShopRite. We just launched nationally with Sprouts. Um, we'll be in Giant soon. Um, and a couple other retailers across the country. And then we do sell on our website as well. So that's the greaterneed.com. All right, maybe I should have had dinner before this, <laughs> before this <laughs> program. Um, it's interesting that uh, Libby and um, Karina spoke to in agreement about starting and leading with passion. I got to tell you, the first question on my list here is when you became a founder, did you go after an idea or pursue a passion? I'm curious whether Cheryl or Michelle um, or Tracy would like to weigh in on whether you pursued uh, a camp idea or camp passion. Well, for me, it was really about the idea, but I had always wanted to start my own business. I always felt that I I, I was ve I'm very creative. I love thinking. I love problem solving. So I was chasing after the, uh, the idea and to solve this problem about designing a bag where I could organize and separate my shoes or my lunch and laptop and not carry two or three bags. I had no background in fashion design, um, nothing manufactured. And I'm sorry to say I never even worked at a mall. <laughs> so I, need, I just didn't even have merchandising, but, it was, but I fell in love with the idea of coming up with something very unique and new. Um, and I love creating, I love designing. Um, and I feel that I'm a problem solver. I actually have two patents on my bags. Uh, so I, I, that's what I was chasing after, the idea and solving the problem. Great answer. How about you, Tracy? 
Uh, well, it just depends on where I'm at, but I think that at some point, if you're not passionate about what you do, it's going to show through to the people that you hire, the pe your customers, your investors, your audience. You really have to believe in what your, it's not, the idea is there, but I think that if you aren't fully behind it, um, that those audiences are going to understand that that's, it's not about what you're trying to do. It's not very authentic and organic. So um, for me, uh, Journal My Health is, it's an, it's an idea that I'm very passionate about. And the more that I learn about how, especially women are not being heard um, when they're trying to tell their stories, their healthcare stories, it's, it's important for me. It's become even more important for me. So the passion has been growing along with the idea. Okay. Good perspective. Uh, Michelle. Yeah. So I'll add, I mean, very similar experience. And I actually, I do a lot of talking to younger, like female entrepreneurs starting. And I always say that there's three things that I think make you successful and it's passion, persistence, and red lipstick, which I'm happy to talk offline with anybody who's wondering what I mean by that. But I always say like, you have to have passion in what you're doing. Um, for me, I have always loved baking. It took me a while to figure out that I could take my passion and make that a business. And what does that mean? And you know, I love bagels. I'm not necessarily passionate about bagels. I think bagels are great, but what I am passionate about is the group of people that we serve with um, allergens. And, um, you know, it was something that I slowly kind of discovered because at the time that my sister and grandfather were diagnosed with celiac disease, I knew I wanted to start a business before that. And I knew I wanted it to have something to do with food, but I wanted it to be something that mattered and that people cared about and that other people were looking for. So I went with what was important to me at that time. I was trying to eat a little bit healthier. So I was looking at lower fat or lower carbs. What does all of that mean? And I was passionate about that because that's the personal way that I eat and connect with food. But when my sister, and my grandfather were diagnosed, I realized that that was a bigger idea than how I eat. So I may not be someone who eats a bagel every single day while I love bagels, but I'm serving a purpose for people who can no longer connect with that food because of a food allergy. And so at the beginning, I did not have any kind of food intolerances myself. So it was something where it was like, yes, this isn't necessarily how I live and lead my lifestyle, but I'm passionate about the group of people that we're serving and I see the importance. And then of course, over the years, I realized I have a dairy intolerance and a gluten intolerance. And so now I'm even more passionate about it. So I think that it, it does kind of evolve and you have to be a little bit flexible because something that you love, the world may not love. So you kind of have to have that flex passion of what you're creating. And then the idea that you're passionate about like finding something that the world connects with as well. And, and that you kind of can like adjust those things as you develop your idea. It's great advice. It's great advice. And and I think as I, I hear some of you, you do have that kind of married it in between. And as Cyril said, she fell in love with the idea. And that is like translating into to a passion. And um, yeah, Pam, can I jump in for a second? Um, sure. I always advise companies not to fall in love with the idea, but to fall in love with the problem. Because you can then change your solutions to the problem. But if you fall in love with the solution, then it can lead you to a dead end. So it's as, as I look at the companies here, every one of us found the problem, got passionate about solving this problem. And that's why we're in business. And then passion is important because entrepreneurship is sometimes stressful, sometimes lonely. Sometimes, uh, you know, you have bumps in the road. It's the passion that makes you go through that. Um, but I wouldn't separate the two into separate camps. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good perspective. That's like a mic drop, you know, on the fall in love with the problem. I'm going to take that home. Uh, if I could stay on you, Karina, um, as you work, you know, there's been tremendous growth in the female founded companies uh, securing funding. Um, Female founded startups in the United States raised 54.6 billion from 3,871 capital funded deals. Um, as you work with your clients, what are you seeing as they navigate the funding landscape? 
at the moment? Well, yes, there are many more female entrepreneurs, which is a wonderful trend, and they are raising money. Um, if you look at how many investors are female, it's still a really abysmal amount. So we have to work on that. Um, what I see is that we as women present ourselves differently. Um, I sit on the advisory board for Ben Franklin um, Technology Partners, one of the largest um, seed investors here in Pennsylvania, and I see women and men pitch. Um, what I see and what I advise companies is uh, we tend to highlight deficiencies when uh, men to tend to highlight the solutions to those deficiencies. An example would be if you initially outsource the development of your product to another company. Uh, female, I just advised female founder in um, Copenhagen who was saying, you know, I know I, I have a need for internal CTO and I'm sorry that I don't have it yet. And yet she found the, the, the solution to her problem. She outsourced the development. She, she moved the product along, right? The male founder probably would not position it that way. So we still need to be more confident. Um, but I also have to say that, um, you know, whether you are male or female entrepreneur, it's, it's the same. It's tough to raise money. Um, you need to um, evaluate the investor as much as they're evaluating you. It needs to be a dialogue. And so you really need to um, be expert in what you do, but also stand your ground and find the right partner. Investor is not a parent, it's a partner. And um, you just need to go through all the right steps to find the right one. Patty, okay. can I, do you mind Tracy. if I So um, a, a colleague of mine and I started a new podcast called The Founding Women, and it's based on our discussion around her frustration. She, her startup is about um, 18 months ahead of, of mine. And it's her frustration of the amount of times that she's had to pitch um, to be out there and the nose that she's getting, even though she has a solid business plan and is bringing in revenue, which we're all told is those benchmarks that we need to, as a business, regardless of who's founding it. Um, we believe there's a bias out there for women. And I'm, you know, based on what I'm reading, um, I'm, I may disagree with your stats. There's still not enough women are getting funded. I think it's still at 2%, which is really, really low. And we're seeing more women who are, you know, not just, um, they're expanding across different categories as well. So it's not just the traditional categories that we've seen women entrepreneurs in. Um, I agree, you know, we need more female investors. Um, women have to take more risk with their money, with their time, with their ideas. So it's, it needs to be on both sides. And I'm glad that you highlighted the, the male allies who are on this call, because I think that that's important. We're gonna need champions to, to break through. And then as we become successful and have more dollars in our pocket, um, we need to make sure that we are pulling up others behind us. Um, I just also just want to highlight one thing. There's the greatest um, transfer of wealth that has started happening about five years ago, and it is happening for women, um, whether it's through divorce, um, through inheritance, through working. And that money is not coming back in to you know, support women entrepreneurs. So that's definitely something we need to see more of. Thank you for raising some of those valuable points. And yeah, regardless of what the numbers are, we still lag um, very much um, behind our counterparts um, in the, the male founder space. Um, but, I, but I'm glad, um, Karina, you brought up about this, you know, partnership kind of thing with your uh, investors. I want to talk about a different kind of partner, um, Libby. Tell us about the idea of when you consider best practices for co-founders. I know that you work as a co-founder uh, in your startup. So um, there may be some folks in our audience that are considering that co-founder relationship. 
Yeah, uh, great question. Thanks, Pam. I, um, I think it's really important to share the passion for being in love with the problem, which I just love and I wrote down, Karina, because that is really what it all comes down to. We may see uh, the business in different ways, which is good. Um, and I think as long as we come back to the fact that we are in love with the same problem and passionate about that problem, we're going to look for ways to solve it no matter what. And I really appreciate that my co-founder, Evan, and I think about problems differently because we come to the table with maybe very wide varying viewpoints on how we think we should solve something. And that forces us to think differently and try to get more information about what we're trying to solve. So I think it's good to find someone who doesn't necessarily look exactly like you, think exactly like you, come from the same background. I think that's really important. Um, and uh, I, I learn from him every day and um, we, we, at, you know, at the end of the day, with any partnership that you're in, you have to have that respect, that mutual respect. And so um, as we build the business together, we respect one another's viewpoints. We encourage each other to be, to, to not agree with the other, which I think is really important to not get that group thing. But hey, disagree with me, tell me I'm wrong. And I think that really, really feeds a healthy uh, relationship between us as co-founders and also uh, throughout the team. We try to bring in team members who don't think like us, who see things differently, who have different backgrounds, so that we can get a really diverse look at what problems we're trying to solve and make sure everyone has a voice at that table. They have to see that at the leadership level too. So. Thank you. That's important because I, I know that there's you know quite a few that's probably on this call that need to hear this. Cheryl, you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, we were talking about you know, women not having access to funding. I just want to really stress that um, as uh, African-American women or people of color, the access to funding is even lower than 2% is 0.35%. And so we could check all the boxes that says we're, you know, we have the revenue, we have the business plan, we have this, that, and the other, but it's still very difficult. So I wanted to make sure that I stress that point. And then, you know, going back to the passion, I always, and for me, it was the passion about the problem and solving the problem. I always say that it's passion with a little sprinkle of obsession for me, just a sprinkle. And the reason why I say that, because I mean, I've been doing this for years and there have been plenty of days when things just did not go right and you want to give up and you want to say if this you know is this what i'm supposed to be doing and so you have a lot of days when things are just not going your way and so you're still pushing through you have to love it so sometimes it's like i'm going to say i am not going to be defeated i am not going to give up even though i have those days where i i can't do this anymore because of access to capital because of manufacturing. So I just, you know, want to be clear about that, that every day is not rosy. I don't think everybody who starts a business love things the way things go every day. So there are some days where it's like, I just can't do this anymore. So that's why I say for me, it's a, <laughs> a little sprinkle of obsession because I just keep going and going, but you, you know, so that that's what I wanted to add in there. Thank you. And, and I'm going to put you on standby because I want to hold that thought on uh, that manufacturing because, and I'm going to pick up on your healthy obsession. Okay. So talk about healthy obsession. Let's talk bagels and let's talk manufacturing. Michelle, share with us a little bit about what it's like going into a food industry, regulated industry perhaps, and also from the manufacturing standpoint during, you know, challenging times. Yeah, um, I think that the biggest thing for me is that I did not have any experience in the food industry because it was just a, a passion and excitement about creating um, a solution to this problem that my family was having. So I surrounded myself with a lot of resources. Um, Google was like my biggest friend because I had no idea where to start. And so I started there and I started researching what are different trade shows and are there local Philadelphia you know, food communities where I can learn more about other people who have started up in the food industry. And that's how I got a lot of my information. 
it worked out really well. I started in the summer and that fall, there's a huge food show called the Natural Products Expo. There's one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. And the East Coast one was happening. It was only a drive down to Baltimore. Now it's also in uh, actually in Philly. So it's it was even more local over the years. And I did a lot of like classes that they had for um, entrepreneurs starting in the food industry. So that was like a huge, huge help. And I think that also for me and part of my like entrepreneur journey was really trusting my gut too. So honoring that there's like a lot that I don't know, but also charting my own path, um, but balancing that with obviously some best practices. Um, And it's still something that I really try to practice because I think especially as women, um, we do have this like, instinct with our gut and our emotions and we're, we know how to tap that. And sometimes like some of the advice that I would get was, oh no, don't do this. You got to do this. This is what every brand does. And I just thought, I, I want to do it the way that I feel like in my gut is the right way. And so I made a lot of different decisions that a lot of people told me were terrible decisions. And here I am 10 years later as proof that they were not terrible. So I think it's, a fine line of surrounding yourself with people, but also owning that, like, make sure that those people jive with you and your personality and that you have a good gut feel because you can get, you can get kind of dazzled by people who are, have been in the industry forever and you just hang on every word that they say, but you also have to kind of like balance what you feel is right for you and what you're building and what your end goals are. And it took me a while to figure that out, but you know, we, we do all of our own manufacturing. That's very rare. It's actually becoming more popular now due to the pandemic and people not being able to find manufacturers. But that was like a non-negotiable for me from the start. And that was like unheard of 10 years ago. Like what? You're a small brand and you're going to build it all yourself. You know how expensive that's going to be. You're never going to be able to get scale, margin, all of this stuff, right? And yes, all of those things were very valid concerns, but I did it anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that, that's kind of been my experience and, and my words of advice. If you're breaking into any sort of like manufacturing or just new industry that you don't know a lot about, it's like go in open to take that feedback, but also put your own twist on it too. Cause that's, what's going to make you different. Thank you. Thank you for sharing some of those resources and, and telling us about your authentic journey into that manufacturing world. Um, Cyril, can you share with us some of your manufacturing hurdles um, now I know you have a background as an engineer, but how about, you know, getting into the, uh, work and travel bag arena? Yeah, just like Michelle, I had no background in manufacturing. When I first started the business, I was pretty adamant about manufacturing in the U S and I was working with the U S trade office to identify a manufacturer here. Um, but it just became cost prohibited, um, that I just couldn't afford it which led me to overseas. Um, And, you know, just, I mean, to be honest, the first batch of bags I had were 30% defective. So with that said, it easily, I could have stopped. I I should have gave up because I lost a lot of money, but it, it gave me pause into really digging in talking to people, understanding how it works, understanding the manufacturing cycle. So I pulled back and, and, and really taught myself and started talking to people before I went to another manufacturer. So it is, it's being flexible, it's believing in yourself that you can, and but then still being wise to get the, the, the resources and talking to people who know more than you do and getting connected into different networks so that you can learn. Um, so it was a big lesson learned <laughs> um, that from, from the manufacturing piece. If I can just jump in for a second. Um, sure. And say that, um, you know, you, you really should tap into an ecosystem. There's so many resources available. And we as women, and you know, when I started my business, I also did it blindly on my own until I realized that there's so many resources available. Um, if you can find them, if you can be part of the incubator, accelerator, like-minded people, share the resources because as startups, we cannot afford a lot of things, but sharing it with each other, it makes a world of difference. 
And then about Michelle's journey, I just want to say it's really important with the consumer goods to be authentic. So it's phenomenal what you did. Um, but I will caution other founders that if you want to stand your ground, sometimes if you're working with investors, they will see this as uncoachable. So there has to be some flexibility built in, right? You take information, you process it, you want to stand by your decisions, but at the same time, you want to be, you, you want to hear other opinions. So it goes both ways. There has to be some give and take. It's Can a balance I, in all things. Tracy, you have something to add. I just learned something last week and definitely learned. I'm, I'm less defensive in terms of protecting, I listen, I try and keep my mouth shut. Um, but somebody just taught me something last week, which is the redirect. So I was like, this is amazing. Why didn't I think about this sooner? So if somebody gives me feedback that might be negative or is constructive criticism that I don't agree with, instead of trying to defend that position, I could learn something um, and ask that question about what do you mean or so try and get a little bit more to the heart of it. Now, it's not always going to work. Um, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't tell you how successful I've been, um, but I am going to try it. I also think that there are nuggets of truth in most constructive criticism that you're hearing, even if you don't want to hear it. There are going to be people out there, I call them dream crushers, um, and they are just going to tell you, no, 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 you are wrong, you are wrong. And I agree with Michelle during Tech Girls, I stood my ground on certain areas that were really key and important. Um, but, I, you know, as to what Karina said, having that little bit of flexibility, and then also just listening and storing away those nuggets, because even if you don't agree, that investor, that mentor advisor, they are giving you a path of objections that you are going to have to answer. So those are things that you should be storing and thinking about, um, you know, as, as potential obstacles that you should be, you could be facing. So, you know, listen to that and, and take heart um, that those are those are keys actually to your success, your future success, even if you don't want to hear it. That doesn't mean that, as Michelle said, that you're not standing your ground on certain things that are very core to, you know, the, the business that you're putting together. Yeah, I think the um, authenticity piece comes up quite a bit and you need to know where you stand on certain things. And I, and to echo what you're saying about, you know, when we hear words of, even if you phrase it as constructive criticism, our ears tend to hang on that word criticism. And it's hard. That gets down in our soul and our spirit. I, I, I coach a lot of startup founders and, and other executives. And the language we use is so important. And when it comes to feedback, I like to borrow Marshall Goldsmith's feed forward. Because if you go out with the idea that everything that comes back like that to you as feedback is really to set you up and, and propel you forward. So it's like that feed forward. But what's required of the feed forward is for the in advisors, the investors, and those things along the ecosystem to choose how they put it forth and what their intention is. And yes, there'll be cautionary tales based on other people's experiences, but everybody looks out of a different lens from their experience and perspective. So it's very well for you to store back those nuggets and never come across them because you will have put yourself in front of an investor that that's not an issue. But it's nice to store those based on the richness of other people's experience. I wanna move on because our, our this has been so valuable and so rich in content, but we've got so much more to cover while we're here. I wanna talk about so that we've got, you know, we, we've talked a little bit of the, you know, that mindset just now, the manufacturing, um, what about the marketing aspect of it? Um, I want to pose this to Libby to start us off and then would like anybody else to chime in in terms of, of what was your biggest hurdle um, or your experience in getting that out to market? Great question. So particularly talk, with your target audience as well, if you could bring that into the conversation. Absolutely. Um, 
So I'll, I'll jump back to when Chipotle was a startup um, and, and start there. Um, it was really important. And I, and I think in any, you know, with food and beverage is to get people to actually taste your food. And so um, that experiential aspect of someone interacting with your product, your brand is the most important thing that they can find that value in it. They can find that, you know, that passion that they'll share with you. So I think um, first and foremost is getting people to interact with your brand and to fall in love with it as much as, as you, as you have. Um, so, so that's very, very important. And I think, um, wh whatever, you know, um, business that you're in, so I'll take the burrito business, for example, it's very competitive. And so often people will say, well, I just, yeah, I don't need to have another burrito, but when they actually, you know, taste it and you can tell the story around it, then, then, you know, people can actually, um, you know, see what you're doing and want, want to come back for more. So. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about, you know, that business, I think really speaking to your audience. So if you're going to get in front of a lot of college students is, you know, speaking the language, talking to them about something that matters to them, and then allowing them to, again, you know, interact with whatever it is that, that you're trying to get in front of them. And I think, um, now that we live in this digital space, um, after I left Chipotle, I worked with a gaming app and it was most important to get people to download the app, interact with it, and then be able to see the, you know, the gratification, the reward from, from utilizing, you know, the product and the service. So um, that I think is, is something that's extremely valuable is how am I going to get my product service in the hands of as many people as possible and actually have it create value in their lives. Thank you. And, and for some of us, and I know, and Karina, in your opening statement, you talked about helping companies um, overseas uh, promote and sell their um, items here in the United States. So what about the folks that are on our call that are looking to um, go global? Whether, you know, let's consider just the global when you're switching markets, regardless, you know, if you're taking it from a U.S. to overseas or overseas to here, it's just that put in the mindset of how do I go from I'm doing this in our backyard or halfway across the United States and now I want to go have a bigger footprint? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, demonstrating the traction in other markets is really important. So you typically people go to trade shows, they have good conversations with someone and they think that that person will take them to the other market or they're looking for a distributor but more often than not, they end up being the you know, 500th line in the distributor's catalog. So I usually advise people, um, if you have international clients here, see if they can help you reach their uh, subsidiaries across the globe. That, that would be one strategy. If you're really planning to expand to, let's say, Asian market, which is obviously a large market, then um, don't do it alone. There's so many resources. First of all, every country, every region has dedicated people um, who are interested in bringing businesses from overseas to their countries. They can give you statistics, they can make introductions, they can really do a lot for your small business. Another piece of advice I would say, and I always give this advice to companies coming here, find someone local who is the key opinion leader and add them to your advisory board. These people can really open up markets for you, either through business development or just adding their name. So do your homework, do your due diligence, find those people, um, get them to be on your team. That would be another good strategy. And then I would just break the whole strategy into four buckets, if I may, really quick. First of all, expanding to other markets is expensive. So you do need to consider fundraising for it. Um, and then look at four things. Look at legal aspects. And that means, uh, you know, you're going to go back and forth. What's your immigration strategy? What's your visa status, right? How are you going to incorporate there? Are you going to be a subsidiary of a US company or standalone? What would be your IP strategy? So those, all of this sort of falls into legal bucket. Then your industry specific bucket. If you're in healthcare, you need to understand regulatory reimbursement, whatnot. Then operational, taxation, very different, right? Um, international banking, how are you going to move funds from 
uh, across the border, also not trivial. So you really need to look into that. Um, HR, there are very different employment contracts from country to country. And finally, fundraising. So understanding the area specific. Here in the US, we have a very specific fundraising sort of pitch um, uh, strategy, pitch, uh, the way we construct the pitch is very different, for example, from European or Asian investors. So knowing this four buckets will help you a lot. Thank you. It goes back to your audience, your audience, your audience, who you're in front of. Um, you know, when I listen and I hear about opening up and going global and, and taking my product or service um, to a broader geography, uh, you know, I'm thinking about protections and patent. Um, Cheryl, can you speak to how you went about with your patents or any kind of challenges that you had or maybe the best advice you were given during your patent era? Well, I have a U.S. patent and I have a trademark, U.S. trademark and a trademark in China. Um, I was not able at that time to afford a global U.S. patent. Uh, and so I just stuck with, with the patent that I have here. So I have two patents on the functional well, utility patents. And um, I, it was really, I wanted to understand how to write a patent. This is me because I'm nerdy like this in my engineering, but I did study patents and I wrote my provisional patent and uh, submitted that in 2013. And three years later, I got the utility patent. So, but I, I do advise working with a patent and trademark attorney to apply for your patent. Okay, I don't, yeah, I thank you for sharing that. I, I, I you know, I, I think as, um, Founders is so often that we get caught up in this DIY space, you know, and and whether it's out of curiosity or necessity that we want to do things on our own. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, maybe you can be all things to all people in the beginning, but ultimately it's not sustainable. So, what are some of the first steps you took to bring others on board to help you advance your startup? Michelle, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think especially for me, like making the product, selling the product, marketing the product, delivering the product, there was a lot for one person to do. Um, so my schedule of like making product on Mondays and Tuesdays, selling product on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and then driving around in my car to deliver could only take me so far. So I knew, um, pretty early on, like within six months, I kind of had a goal for myself of when I knew I could afford someone and I found, um, a friend of a friend, you know, I just kind of put it out there. I um, ended up hiring like a college student that was still in school, was curious about entrepreneurship, wanted to kind of see the building of a business from the ground up. So it was like a perfect opportunity to just have my first sort of carbon copy. And her and I pretty much did everything. So now it was like two of us making product on those two days and two, like she did the Jersey delivery route. I did the uh, Philadelphia delivery route. And it was like that, um, you know, slowly but surely, and then adding a couple more people for quite a while. And then, you know, eventually got to the point where then I'm looking at more executive level positions, like really shifting, what do I do best for the company? And I was just having this conversation um, with my team the other day, because we made some more changes within our executive group. And what I think as a founder I find is like sometimes I need to be the salesperson and fuel that and that's what I'm best at um, especially in the early days to share my story and connect with buyers and really kind of make that impression but like right now we're working on scaling and like I'm the operations person and I have a team within operations but I need to be like overseeing it to help them with this next phase which none of us have ever done and that's the scaling and implementing some new machinery and just some of the complexities with supply chain and stuff like that. And so I'm leaning on, you know, our advisors for those pieces. So I think it's become like kind of flexible what I need, you know, one time or what role I play constantly changes. And then you just kind of try to staff and hire around that and obviously filling in what you're weakest at. So like one of my very first hires after sort of those initial like bakers just helping me make product was somebody with a financial background because I knew that I didn't have that strength there. Um, and then there's also outsourcing too. So like, don't forget that there are tons of resources to outsource. So like right now we actually just transitioned from a full-time 
marketing person to an actual, like actually a fractional CMO. And we're getting a lot more experience for a lower cost. And yes, there's less hours that they're dedicating, but we're actually getting a lot more out of that position than the internal hire. Um, Cause it is a lot to manage as well. And so as a founder and the CEO, you know, you're a lot of times you're having to wear those, those hats until you can really transition into a true CEO position. And that, that takes time. And, you know, I'm still not there most, most days. So, you know, trying to manage internal people is definitely a challenge. And so outsourcing is a nice way. And I saw someone did ask a question about HR and like, that's actually something we outsource as well. And we started doing that very early on. Um, so we use a third party uh, professional employer organization that does our benefits, our HR, all of our employee liability insurance, they hold worker comp, all of that kind of stuff, uh, 401k management. So there's definitely resources like that for you if you're worried about how you're gonna find those people with expertise. Yeah, I think I agree. Outsourcing initially is the way to go. Um, I don't think you should hire in-person HR until you have about 50 people when you really need to start putting together packages of uh, benefits and whatnot. Um, the fractional CFO is a great idea for a lot of companies as well. Um, but also, I just want to mention um, creating a board creating a board of directors and a board of advisors can really propel your company, especially if you're fundraising and um, these people can bring in their business development um, you know, opportunities. So um, I advise a lot of startups to, to do that before you fundraise. Tracy. Yeah, I would um, caution on the outsourcing of your sales um, because you want to be close to your, to your initial customers. Um, so I would just be cautious on, on that standpoint. I think that that's, sales is really, really important. Yeah, and I would also agree of limiting, you know, internal hires, you know, really looking at core team, looking at what holes, what gaps you have, and then looking for those external people who are, you know, sharing the same passion and want to just give you some sweat equity, so to speak, so that they're they're offering their expertise, they're looking for something where they can really contribute to uh, and leave their legacy and and they're not an internal hire because yes, that's an it's, it's incredible lift to have a very uh, large internal team. But if you have a lot of people who are contributing nine hours a week, five hours a week, two hours a week, it can really, really help at early stages. Love the creative solutions. And again, um, this panel has just been wonderful in their authenticity and, and the expertise that goes with it and, you know, showing up authentically, but infusing it with all their expertise. And I think when you're, you're in those early days of startup and you're trying to do it all yourself, and maybe even as you're in the middle of it, but you're, you're, you're pivoting and you're scaling and you're going after a new challenge. How do you balance, you know, that work-life balance as, as female founders? Tracy, do you have something to weigh in on that? Or um, maybe you had your mic off in the last one. <laughs> yeah, no, I had my mic off, but I would say the balance, this is a hard question. And the reason I'm gonna say it's a hard question is because I'm not sure how often a male panel would be asked this question. So, you know, no, no disrespect on this one, but, you know- I agree. I, so- I agree. Oops. I was just wondering if we might be able to move on to another question. Um, well, actually, I want to weigh in. Um, as female founders, this is our opportunity to create a workspace that is um, amazing, that teaches people what a great workplace could be. Um, me and my partner, um, who is also amazing, we have a, a rule that we don't work with people we don't like, for example. Um, I know this is childish, but... Um, you know, in corporate America, there are a lot of abuses. So here we are, we started this business for a reason. And this is our opportunity to show the workforce how it could be done, how it could, how you can be a company with a work-life balance, still passionate, still at revenue, but, um, you know, treat everyone with respect and equally and create that environment that you wanted to create in the first place. So 
I would just uh, turn this question a little bit and use it as an opportunity for us um, to create those um, amazing companies that we all wanted to work for. Right. So, uh, you know, just piggybacking off Corinna. So thank you. Um, Chariot started off thinking about culture and how that was number one. So that culture is the authentic organic piece that I think every business really needs to think about. And if that is part of your culture, then as you are hiring, you're making sure to bring all of that information and the way that you want to manage your business to everyone that you hire. So that, that's a different tact on this. Um, I would agree that the, the work culture is that broader umbrella. Um, I, I just know um, that, you know, you know, whether it's a trade question or it, it is out there. And, and I think it's just one that we even needed to bring up. And I'm glad we brought it up because then it initiated this conversation now to change the dialogue that's around it. Um, so that work culture is across, uh, across the levels, you know, whether it's leadership at every level and, and regardless of um, the makeup of your, your work team. I want to um, talk about the space of, of, tech today. And um, I know um, some of our experts here, Tracy, uh, you know, the world of uh, tech startups um, offer a tremendous amount of opportunity um, now. I'm just wondering what the pulse is on that now in terms of the opportunity that presents itself for women in the world of tech. Wow. So, you know, this is something that I think is really important. I've been talking about this for 15 plus years. Um, it is important for women to participate in technology companies. One, because products and services are being created without an understanding of diversity and diverse thought as these products and services are being created. So it's better for a company to have those diverse voices at the table to create better products. That's the, that's, selfishly from a business standpoint, from a female um, standpoint and non-traditional technologist, there is no better time to be part of technology. And a technologist is not just somebody who is a software coder, um, software engineer. It is so much more than that. I'm a technologist. I have to know how to speak to the, the folks who are creating the back end of our product. Um, I have to understand as much as I can, um, you know, the ins and outs as we're in, it's no different than understanding manufacturing. But right now, um, the flexibility, um, the, the salaries, the, the opportunity, we are all going to need tech in our lives. Um, in our businesses, no matter what we're doing. So whether it's somebody who's doing marketing, technology and manufacturing go hand in hand, right? Um, so it's just important for women to not shy away from the technology field because they think it's just all about software development. Um, although those are, that's a great field. Um, but it's also how women can think about technology in innovating for their businesses. And there's no greater time. There's never been a greater time. I think it comes back to the problem that we're solving, right? Mm -hmm. And you can look at nurses that are great in their job, but they find deficiency they bring in technology to right. fix those deficiencies. You can see at architects doing, you know, it's whatever field you're in, you solve problems most of the time with technology. Right. So um, I wouldn't separate women and technology, we're in it. Um, however, I will point out some industries where, you know, if you go to a pharmaceutical conference, for example, um, you will still see the, pale, male, stale, as I call it, because that's, <laughs> that's the, the, the type of people you will see in the audience. You will see old white male, mostly. 
Um, so some industries, hopefully, we're still, you know, we're making a push, we're bringing a change. But I think, uh, you know, if you're solving a problem that you are passionate about and you solve it through technology, that is your women in tech solution, no matter which field you're in. Right. And I think um, Corinna brings up a super point, which is we're back to innovating. So how are we taking ideas that are coming from experts in that field and marrying them with people who can provide the technology and putting that together? And I think sometimes there is this uh, thought process that I can't, if I don't have a tech background, I don't have a tech founder, um, I'm just lost. And there's ways of getting around that. And, you know, I'm happy to talk to people um, if anybody, you know, wants to have a discussion around that offline, we can do that. There are ways of testing your product and your idea without necessarily having that, uh, tech founder knowing how to, how, how to code. That's great. And I'm glad that we've extended the perception and and the kind of defined the technology portion of it and brought it in it with the term innovation, because with innovation comes that creativity. And regardless of what you are creating in your startup world, if you're not innovating, you do get, you know, stale and stagnant. Um, so that anybody else want to weigh in from the innovation and creativity that they afforded themselves, because I want to have this conversation so that somebody's sitting there and going, I don't have a STEM background. Um, you know, Cheryl has an engineering background that, you know, she created, you know, didn't stepped into the arena of fashion um, so that any of the other creativity that has propelled your company forward. I think it's important to talk about that level of innovation through creativity. Yeah, I think technology is becoming synonymous with business. So no matter what your background, maybe what you studied or what your jobs have been, every company will have an aspect of innovation and technology in it. Um, and so uh, it, it, it sort of finds itself in every department and everything that you do. So there won't be this division of, 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 of tech and other uh, roles. It's going to be in every role. Um, so, you know, not being afraid to embrace it, you know, bit by bit, and then asking questions um, from people who do know much more about it maybe than you do and not being afraid to ask. I think so often, you know, when you get in a room and there are a lot of technologists and they're almost speaking a different language can be very intimidating, but actually asking someone, hey, can you break this down for me? You learn a little bit, you know, and don't need a background necessarily, an engineering background in order to be very fluent in many of these conversations where people are talking about technology and how they utilize it. Cheat code. Key points, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I told you this was gonna be a dynamic conversation. I told it it was gonna be engaging and hard to believe, but we've already been through an hour uh, of it. Um, I, I wanna talk about um, kind of that, just the advice that you got that was the best advice at one point that you, you, you look at where you're at in business and thought, had they not told me this, I wouldn't be where I was today. Cheryl. I'll just, you know, uh, as little girls, there's things that you hear. And in particular, I'm going to just say what my mom used to tell me when I was younger. Nothing beats a failure, but a try. And she would say that over and over and over again. So no matter how many challenges that I come against, how many obstacles I come against in my business, I hear that over and over again. And my mom passed years ago, but that what we say to our children when they're younger has an impact on how we move through life when we're older. And so I always hear that nothing beats a failure with a try. And so I keep pushing, I just keep pushing. Um, and that has made a huge impact on what I do today and, and build in my business. Terrific, I, it reminds me of Yoda's where there is no try, there is just do, you know, it's like the mm-hmm. Star Wars Yoda um, segue. Uh, Karina. I just wanna say, I I work with companies from around the world with very different cultures, but um, what we have here in the United States is so unique because we celebrate, or at least we started to celebrate failures. 
because each failure leads to new try, just like what Cheryl said. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley now, they have this fail fest where, you know, you brag about your failures because you learn so much through it. Um, I see a lot of industries where it's still not quite there and a lot of countries that are so afraid of failures. But I think the, pro the progress can only live on the amount of failures that you get until you hit it right. So to me, that is, um, that is a cause for celebration. I like that perspective too. And with that, if we could stay on this line of looking at the quote, tries or the failures um, as gifts and opportunities. You know, starting businesses is, is about trial and error at some point. And, and so what were some of the gifts and opportunities that came out of something that you, you missed the mark on? You know, you missed the mark, you made a mistake, call it whatever, whatever you want. Um, but um, does anybody have a story to share on how you saw that as a gift and opportunity, even that you can see it now, but maybe when you're going through it, you didn't see it that way. I mean, I have <laughs> a lot of things I could, I could talk about. Oh, my gosh. Uh, let's see. I was doing a crowdfunding campaign years ago, uh, 2013, 2014, and I was missing my mark. I had two weeks left from missing my mark. I was trying to raise $15,000, and I was nowhere near $15,000, and it's two weeks left, and I'm always at this mindset what else I can do because I tapped out family and friends and I kept saying, what else I can do? What can I do to raise this money? And so I started emailing uh, TV shows and so forth and all kinds of people. And seven days before my campaign was to end, I got a call from the Katie Couric show. Would I come on the show? <laughs> Would I just come on the show? They were doing this segment, Mom Entrepreneurs, and um, it was seven days before my campaigns ended. And if I had given up when I thought I didn't raise, couldn't raise any more money because family and friends, if I said, that's it, that's it, I, I just don't know what else to do, I would not have gotten what I needed at the end of that story. So it's always something that you can do. You have to give it all. What else can you do to get to the next point? There's always something you can do. Even when you feel like there's nothing less, keep going because there's something else you can do. <laughs> I just want to uh, jump and say that COVID threw a wrench into a lot of businesses. And so the first accelerator for international companies that I had here in Philadelphia was in person. It was one week before a big international bio show. Um, it never even occurred to me that I can do it online. And then COVID happened. And so out of that necessity, uh, suddenly you can pitch to investors online. And it doesn't matter if you're in Australia or in Poland, right? So the world changed, we adopted, this is one of the one of those examples where we just keep on spinning no matter what. Wonderful. Uh, before we go into the final rapid round of, of you know sharing some key takeaways, Don, do we have any questions that have come in? Uh, I think we addressed to, to a certain degree. There was a question about um, the importance of HR. Uh, how quickly do you bring in an HR resource, whether it's a fractional uh, person or you know uh, you know something of that nature, to um, not not just you know for for you know hiring per se, but for understanding you know again what they're starting to call you know uh, people operations. It's right they're they're renaming HR now um, to to better understand that you know the, the 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 value of human capital, not just a job description. Anybody have any value to add within their, um, that might be within the HR hiring space, uh, something you know now that you wish you knew then? I just wanna point that um, you really need to hire an expert when you start hiring people, because I always point to the example, 
each state has different laws. Um, and, you know, when I talk to international companies, I always say you're going to be dealing with 51 countries, 50 states and the federal, right? So each state has their own HR laws and the same person doing the same job in Massachusetts could be an employee in, in Pennsylvania, could still be a contractor. So please hire the experts who can help you navigate through the employment laws. Good point. But once upon a time in my career, I represented an organization that was an international association of HR uh, lawyers. Um, and they have foot soldiers all around the ground. If somebody's looking for expertise in somewhere or part of the world, they have tremendous resource online um, that I'd be happy to share with everyone. Um, Okay, so let's go into our uh, final. What is it that you know now that you wish you knew then? Choose that one, or there's something that you came on here that uh, you wanted to share and the line of questions didn't address it. We'll give you that opportunity to put forth those key takeaways for our audience. Well, I'll, I'll start as I kicked off. Um... I, I think what I've learned is about fear and how fear will hold you back. And I, I totally agree with Sherelle that if you don't try, you're not going to even, you know, get in the in the ballpark. I was afraid of failure. There's ways to mitigate your risk and and the size of the failure um but i think the biggest thing is letting fear stop you from even getting started yeah i think for me it's um thinking big um we're all so focused on something immediate and stepping back and looking at the, the largest possible picture you can imagine um, is where I finally, maybe it's age, <laughs> but I finally start to see that um, we can really tackle big, big problems. Um, and so dreaming big, I think, um, is important when you're an entrepreneur. Thank you, Karina. How about you, Cheryl? Yeah, I um, thought about that question. I don't think I would have wanted to know what I know now because I probably wouldn't have started. <laughs> and I say that because it's, it has not been easy. This entrepreneurship is hard. And sometimes if you know the things that you were going to go through, you, you know, as a human being, you don't want to put yourself through certain things. Um, so, uh, I don't, I, I'm enjoying the journey, um, but it's not easy. And so I just, I, as I mentioned, I persevere and I am looking forward to things happening as um, in, in October, I'm launching in Macy's. I'm talking to a couple of retailers, but had, you know, just the journey has been difficult. So that's where I'll leave that at that. <laughs> Good insight, Libby. Uh, so I have three words on my desk, never give up. And I look at them every day, sometimes every hour. Uh, and we've talked a lot about persistence here today, but there's another term that I love that we use regularly and it's called messy middle. And I've gotten really comfortable in the messy middle. And that's where we spend a lot of time. So, you know, you think success is just this straight line and you know, <laughs> here we go. And it's not. The most of the journey is like this. And so there are those days when you're just thinking to yourself, this is this is so messy. How am I going to get out of this? And with the never give up attitude, you find a way and you surround yourself with really smart people uh, and you'll get there. But I think it is it is important to talk about the mental health and the, the mental state. It's not an easy place to be as an entrepreneur, you really need to have a support network. You really need to surround yourself with the people that support your journey because it's sometimes very lonely and sometimes very messy, exactly as Libby said. Yeah. 
Great. How yeah, about that you, was going to be my, yeah, that was going to be my contribution was actually mental health and really make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And, um, I think that would have been helpful for me to know getting into it. Um, you know, 10 years ago, like I had no idea. I was still trying to gain my confidence as a young woman, just starting out. And, um, I think mental health really came in and, and that t- ties into pretty much everything that all of us has said, because you will address fear within that, you know, and um, all of the sort of things that you are up against with yourself, because I really think that the biggest thing standing between you and your goals is, is really like yourself or, you know, and, and you're the one that um, can make those changes, but you've got to kind of conquer those things and you have to work on your own mental health and your balance. And like, when we talk about work-life balance, I look at it as your own mental health balance of making sure you make time for you and building that in from day one to, you know, when you can afford to have a full team doing things for you, there's always going to be something else to do or this thing to fix. And you have to also know when to kind of turn it off and find other healthier ways to feed your soul than just work, work, work. And Um, one big quote that I always try to remember, and I stress this to my team is, and there's so many ways to say this, but the simplest way I found is just perfection is the death of progress. Like there's other way. I know there's all other quotes to say it, but like perfection doesn't exist. Just do it, figure it out. It will be messy. Like, I think that just builds on everything that we said. It's not going to be perfect. It never will be. That's just not a real thing. And so don't, don't let that stop you from actually making progress. And I think those are all things that definitely held me up in, in my journey of getting to where I am. And Pam, if I could just bring in one other thing. Um, and I think this relates a little bit to Corinna and, and what uh, Michelle was just saying. Um, in addition to having a board that's about your company, having a personal board is really important. That helps with your own personal growth. It makes you a better leader. And the, and sometimes there, there may be some crossover, but um, I think that is helpful to when you have an issue um, that you're able to go and talk about it in a way that isn't about the business and it's to support you. And, you know, I think the mental health piece is really, because it is so tough. Um, I think sometimes, you know, for me, I eat, an, you know, I eat ice cream, so that, that makes me feel better, but it's also good to have somebody that you can talk to. Um, And sometimes you just, you know, you shouldn't really, you can share some things with your employees, but, you know, that isn't always the best course of action. So having a place where you can have that discussion um, for that support, um, not only for personal growth, but also to help you with that balance. Spot on, spot on. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, um, importance of the mental health, the mindset, or like I like to call when I'm coaching my clients is the mental fitness aspect of sustaining you through this. Um, I, I love the idea that uh, perfection doesn't exist, but, but whatever we're going to call it, uh, these women, this female founder panels that we put together, um, they nailed success even without their perfection since it doesn't exist. So um, I really want to thank everybody. I'm I want to tell the audience, this is the type of value, you know, this is the type of value that you're going to get from our inspirational, motivational, sometimes educational all the time, um, transformational um, for you and your business, uh, or it's the programs that we put together. Uh, If you missed the announcement at the top of the program, our enrollment now is currently taking place um, that for our next cohort class of startup founders who are interesting, interested in taking their business, maybe it's the idea, maybe they're looking for funding, maybe they, just as we just talked about, that entrepreneurship and the founder life is, it can be difficult and can be lonely. And when you align yourself with Founder Institute, you're not alone through that. Um, so that we're going to put in the uh, chat, I believe, you know, a link if somebody's interested in getting more information on that next cohort. Um, We also are going to have our next webinar that's going to be chock full of information and expertise, just like this one, is taking place on September 7th at 6 p.m. 
This one is pitch your startup idea to Philadelphia investors and experts online. Attend this one. You can take advantage of the opportunity to pitch your idea before a panel of experts and advisors and, and um, uh, fans or future fans. Um, but if pitching's not for you, go ahead and come anyway, because just sitting back in the comfort of your own home, you're going to learn a tremendous amount from that feed forward that they get and the advice that those pitch folks are going to get during that. The link is going to be uh, available to you in our chat. I want to take this time to uh, thank all of our female founders and um, sharing your time, sharing your expertise, showing up authentically. Um, if we uh, can put in the chat, ladies, if you want to tell people how they can best get in touch with you, whether it's a you know website, whether it's an email, some other way. I also wouldn't been able to have moderated this panel uh, aside from needing the expertise of our female founders. I have Don Samoyle and Bill Ripken as our wing person that have been driving this from the back end of things and um, also are part of the leadership team of Founder Institute Keystone. If you don't already follow us on LinkedIn, I would suggest that that is a fantastic way to be kept informed of the upcoming, not only online events, but some in-personal events, and also just to stay on the pulse of the startup ecosystem here in Philadelphia. Um, I encourage you to follow Founder Institute Keystone. You can also find us on Twitter. And um, with that, I, I, I just hope that this has inspired you all to either step into the startup arena if you're not yet there, or to scale up if you've already stepped into that arena and you wanna scale it up with the support of Founder Institute Keystone. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to thank you for your participation and um, Hope to see you online again for one of our webinars. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was very inspiring. Thanks from the panelists. Thank you.